your firm owns 6% of this company, um, over a billion dollars now. Mm -hmm. When you invested in this company, it was not a clear investment, which is to say there was a, a, a real view that this was a winner-take-all market, something that Roger McNamee just said, talked about. Yeah. Uh, and uh, here we turned out that way. And here we are. Yeah. So historically, you make early investments in companies. You haven't been a public company investor, typically not. Mm -hmm. How long do you stay in this stock? Well, we're big believers, and the, the main thing about it is Lyft is gaining share. So, you know, when you have a company that's winning share, you stay in it, and I think it's going to continue to win share for the foreseeable future. How much, though, is that a function of discounting incentives, marketing and promotion in terms of a money-losing proposition but gaining share relative to a situation where there isn't that kind of spend? Yeah, so I think that's actually a misunderstanding of what's going on because their uh, marketing spend and uh, driver incentive spend has gone down where their profit, well, their profitability has gone up and their market share has increased over the last year. So you really, you know, like that's a theory, but it's not actually supported by the numbers. The numbers say they're just winning people like Lyft better. Do you believe that there's a path to profitability and what does that look like to you? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think if you look at the unit economics and they, you know, went through that with investors, which is, you know, part of the reason it was so well received, is the unit economics are already good and, and improving at a, at a very steady rate. And you can see that in the financials. So I think absolutely. And I think um, the way uh, pricing is now in the market between them and Uber, like you can see the path to profit. How does this investment to you stack up against Uber, which is something you looked at at yes. the same time, too. Yeah. Look, so we like the character and the culture of the Lyft guys better than Uber and um, continue to. And, like, we take a very long view of these things. We tend to invest in things for a decade or more. So we're happy to be patient. Uh, and, like, so far, we're, we're quite pleased. But for you guys, do you think this is a five-year story out, five years out, ten years out? You, you think you're... Still yeah, we're huge believers. Like, we think Lyft is the best company in uh, what is looking like one of the best markets in the world. But to get to that next place, does it have to have international expansion? Do you ever see them getting into, you know, Uber, getting into eating or other kind of services that you layer on top? Well, we've added bikes and scooters. Right. Uh, so that's, that's probably the first one. And I don't, I don't want to forecast them doing anything. You know, I'm a board member, right. not a CEO. Right. Uh, but look, there's all there's amazing opportunities uh, given the position they're in. What do you, what's your take on what's going on in the valley right now when it comes to autonomous driving? Because that's another piece of this puzzle. Yes. But it also seems like the timeline has shifted a lot in yes. terms mm -hmm. of the idea that it was here almost just a year ago. People thought we'd be we'd be jumping in these things left and right. Now, yeah. not so much. Well, look, I, I think one, um, it's a hard problem. Right. It, like it is really a hard technical problem. And, you know, the bar for autonomous cars is higher than the bar for human drivers in terms of safety. And I'm for that. Like, I think that's a good thing. And I think a lot of those forecasts were based like, well, if we can do better than people, then we should put them on the road. And um, that's kind of adjusted to, no, they've got to be like way, way safer than human drivers. And I think that's, that's actually a positive. What's your take on the dual class? structure of this company, the idea that Logan and John are going to own 49% of the voting control, but only 5% otherwise. Yes. And given what's happened with Travis Kalanick at Uber, where effectively they stripped that away from him, yes. and some of the questions about Facebook today and about Snap and the, the idea of this dual class as somebody who's on the board? Well, somebody who's on the board and has a billion dollars worth of Lyft stock, right? Like, so, you know, I, I have skin in the game on this one. So I, I, I'm very much for it. Like these guys, one, um, they've got the best vision for the future of transportation. Two, they're the toughest, most resilient founders in all of Silicon Valley and maybe all of business, and they proved that out. And then, you know, like, so would I rather have them right. uh, in the CEO position or a rent a CEO ex-banker type? Like that's an easy decision. If like, this I thing trades good. at 75 or 80 bucks at the end of the day or even more, is that money on the table that was left and a mistake, or is that a good thing? Well, look, you know, these things in IPO, the IPO market is interesting and so forth. I think that uh, you want your investors uh, to make money. Um, and you want, you know, in particular, like the people who believe in the company early to make a gain. So I don't think it's terrible if it goes up. Um, and I think that when a stock goes down, 
particularly in the first year after the IPO, that's a dangerous situation in, in, in some ways in that um, you know, people want to harvest their tax losses, all these kinds of things, and so you get weird stock behavior that you don't want. How, so how I think pivotal, everybody making right. money is a good philosophy. How pivotal is, is the success of this IPO, though, to the rest of the unicorn or now decacorn IPOs that are coming, some of which you've already invested in yeah. and are probably thinking about the exit for? Well, look, I don't want to forecast the IPO market. That's like, uh, that's your job. <laughs> um, I think it's great when great, it's great for the market, it's great for the country, and it's great for business when great companies go public. And a high quality company like Lyft going public is outstanding. It's always bad when low quality companies go public, um, but I think that like from what I've seen, the companies going out this year are of the highest quality. But do you think that there's a an upper limit, if you will, in terms of, I mean, this was something Jim Cramer was talking about. There's a lot of these IPOs that are coming, and, and how much of that can get soaked up by the market and investors? Um, look, I think there's a ton of interest in money um, wanting to invest in the future of growth. I mean, one of the tragedies of the kind of regulation, the regulatory regime of the stock market is we have like half the number of public companies that we had, you know, 15 years ago. And that's basically done terrible things. It's kept individual investors out. It's created a wealth gap. It's, you know, it's very, very bad. So to have really high growth companies going out, um, it's just a great thing. You know, it's great for everybody. I had asked John uh, and Logan about this. You, you were sort of mentioning you're getting into almost the politics of the moment. Do you have any worry, not just about Lyft, but of, of what might be not described as the sharing economy, the idea that the political winds could, could, could move in such a way that all of these contracted workers mm -hmm. effectively have to become employees at some point in the game? Yeah, so, you know, I think that's, um, that would be unfortunate. Uh, I don't think, like, as long as it's the same for everybody, then, you know, I think the businesses still, you know, work in a lot of ways. But, you know, you talk to young people, like the independence is a feature, not a but, right? Like to be able to work when you want, to be able to work for multiple companies, to do that thing, to be an owner of your business as a driver is a breakthrough. And it's not the kind of breakthrough that you want to, you know, you don't want to move from ownership back to employment or from employment back to servitude or like, you know, servitude backwards from that. And so like pushing the world backwards, I think is just a mistake from a, from a legislative standpoint. But, uh, you know, like it would, it'd certainly be worse for the world and worse for workers if it went that way. But um, I think the where businesses you, would, you know, Where do you put that work. risk though now, especially when you think about investing in new businesses? Yeah. That are in this space. Uh, yeah, so I think the, you know, it's, it's a little, it's very hard to forecast policy because, you know, it depends on like the, the political winds. Um, but, you know, so far what we've seen is it's been, you know, mostly a local, not a national phenomenon, and um, that's much more manageable. Uh, for investors this morning who are looking at this IPO thinking, should I buy, should I not? What would you put, you've spent a lot of time in this space. No, no, I'm not going to ask you that. Yeah. But what, how would you think, of, what, what's the comparable company? Is there a comp out there that you would think about when you've, when you've done your valuation work yeah. and put spreadsheets together on this? What do you think about? Look, I think it's you more see, like, you know, it, it's an interesting thing because the companies, historical companies that are most like them are the big telecom networks. So, you know, huge infrastructure build out to build the network and so forth. But once the network is built, it's just a, a super valuable thing. And of course, you know, the big, uh, you know, that did run as a single player thing to start with AT&T. Um, and then, you know, it was broken into the, the baby bells and so forth. But that's the thing that's most comparable. And that's, I think, the right way to think about it. But uh, there, there's nothing exactly like right. it. Um, I'd asked the guys about this before. Uh, Travis Kalanick tried to buy this company in yes. 2014. Do you remember that? Yeah, that is a true story. And, well, he, he confirmed it as well, but yeah. do you remember what you told them then? Well, I thought we shouldn't sell. I mean, I don't remember. Like, I, I thought that, uh, I thought the offer wasn't uh, appropriate for the quality of the company. The company was valued, I think, at $5 billion then. Uh, no, less. no, I think he was offering like 5% of the company. I think that's what, if I recall correctly. I don't think he, that was, he was offering 5% of, of, of Uber. Or maybe less, but it was 5% or less of Uber, yes. 
it wasn't five billion dollars. Like it, five, he might be saying five billion in today's dollars because Uber is worth a hundred now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, fair enough. Uh, thank but, you. Uh, but I think we're trading above that. So.